Okay, yeah. So next oh, talk okay. by Michele Ceriotti from APFL about symmetry, locality, and long-range interactions in atomistic machine learning. Good morning. Uh, just, just tell me, do slides change fine? Yes, works perfectly. Okay, so we can start. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk uh, about some kind of uh, um, fundamental concepts in the construction of uh, representations for machine learning of atomic scale systems. Uh, I guess that many of you have seen uh, Gabor Chani's talk uh, uh, yesterday or no, or Monday, I mean, a couple of days before during this conference, but perhaps uh, some haven't. So I will go there. He has done a fantastic uh, uh, introduction to why we want to incorporate machine learning uh, into atomic scale modeling of materials and molecules. But I'm going to give a very brief uh, recap for those of you who didn't attend uh, his talk. And uh, so in, in general, my problem, uh, the problem that I work on uh, is the modeling of matter at the atomic scale. And the reason why this is uh, an interesting endeavor is that it really provides you a way to understand the macroscopic behavior of materials. You know, eventually you want to be able to understand how the properties of a material contribute to the performance or of device or the mechanical integrity of the uh, wing of the plane. We all at a certain point might again fly on. Um, and you want to achieve uh, fully predictive accuracy. So you want to be able to start with the uh, basic laws of physics uh, and be able to build up a multi-scale model that eventually gives you access to the properties of a device. So the two equations on which all of this effort rests uh, are essentially Schrodinger equation or some approximation to it uh, that allow you to uh, compute exactly or to a certain degree of approximation, the properties of uh, a configuration of your system given the position of the nuclei. If, however, you are interested in the behavior of materials and molecules at finite temperature or including quantum fluctuations of the nuclei, you also need to care about statistical mechanics and therefore you also need to incorporate into your modeling some kind of thermodynamic average. And in practice, the combined uh, uh, need of obtaining accurate evaluation of energies and properties of individual configurations and uh, achieving uh, accurate and fully converged statistical sampling of a thermodynamic ensemble turn uh, this problem of modeling matter at the atomic scale uh, into a bloody nightmare because you need uh, very accurate uh, quantum calculations and each evaluation of your properties become very costly. And you need the thorough fully converged sampling, which means that you have to compute uh, the energies, forces, properties of your configuration hundreds of millions of times. And this is really where I see a huge potential for machine learning to help. Essentially, you know, without too much uh, uh, glamour, just by seeing a machine learning uh, as uh, a very effective and flexible interpolation machine. So the idea is really that ultimately what you want to do is train your model on a set of uh, configurations for which you compute quantum properties as accurately as you possibly can. And then you put together some kind of model. Here I'm writing down the equations for a kerman ridge regression, uh, um, but you could also do some uh, uh, fancy deep model if you wish so. Uh, and eventually you want to be able to prove that the accuracy in predicting new configurations uh, is as high as possible. So there is a very important step uh, in all of these, uh, which I believe is one of the most fundamental in applying machine learning to this class of problems, much more important in my opinion than uh, the details of the regression technique that you use. And this is the representation of your inputs. So how you map the structures of a molecule or of a material to vectors of numbers that you feed uh, to uh, linear kernel or deep neural network uh, regression models. So from this point of view, um, I find uh, 
very, very useful to look at the problem in terms of two guiding principles, symmetry and uh, locality. So the idea is that you get a configuration of your molecule. And uh, the problem is that you want to make sure that the way you represent this uh, structure uh, as the input of your model can gonna indicate in a rather abstract way using uh, uh, a Dirac cat. So this is just an abstract vector a representation of this molecule. This representation I'm saying uh, has to fulfill uh, naturally very fundamental symmetries. So it shouldn't depend uh, on the absolute position of your molecule in space. It shouldn't depend on the order by which you indicate atoms of the same species. And it shouldn't depend on the way this molecule is oriented in space. If you want to predict the energy of a molecule and there is no external field, the energy is exactly the same whether the molecule is oriented like this or like that. So the most uh, simple way of describing the structure of a material, which is just providing the nature of the atoms and their Cartesian coordinates, doesn't fulfill any of these uh, symmetries. And this is a problem because if you just uh, blurt out the Cartesian coordinates of your atoms as the input of a machine learning uh, scheme, then you are in for a lot of trouble. You're in for you know, uh, duplicating your inputs uh, and all of these kind of things that we want to avoid. So many uh, methods have been developed over the past 10 years to map the Cartesian coordinates of the atoms into a symmetric representation. But what I want to guide you through here is a possible way of constructing a symmetrized representation that is very general and it is essentially based on a sequence of uh, uh, integration over symmetry groups. And uh, actually, the outcome of this procedure is a very abstract representation of a structure uh, that you can then uh, convert into most of the representations that are in use today just by the choice of a basis on which you project it. So the first step uh, is getting rid of the dependence of the labeling of the atoms. You don't want your representation to depend on the order in which you sort the carbon atoms in your input. And a very effective way of doing this uh, is mapping these Cartesian coordinates onto a field. In this case, a density field uh, that is built just as a superimposition of uh, localized functions centered on the atoms. Taking, for instance, here Gaussians. Now, you don't want to care about the order of the carbons, but you want to inform your algorithm as to whether in a certain position in space you have carbon, nitrogen, or boron. And essentially, the way we do this is by decorating this density uh, with a cat that indicates the nature of the species. You can regard this as essentially coloring this density according to the chemical composition. Now, this representation is permutation invariant, and we are already getting rid of one of the, more, of the nastiest uh, trivial symmetries that we want our model to incorporate, but it's not even translational invariant. This is a function of R3, and it depends on the absolute origin that we define. So the first step is making this representation translationally invariant. And without getting in too much detail, the way we achieve this is by integrating over the translation group. And in order to preserve uh, as much information as possible, because of course this averaging results in an information loss, we don't integrate just the density, but we integrate the tensor products of this density. And in practice, if we take the tensor square of this density, the result of this, uh, given that essentially you're computing a convolution of Gaussians, uh, is uh, a sum of uh, representations, uh, each of which uh, is again, a density that is centered on each atom. Mm -hmm. And this will become very important in a few slides from now when I'm going to speak about locality. So essentially, the idea is integrate over translations and integrate the tensor products of the density so that you maintain information on the geometry of your system. 
Now we have something which is translational invariant. If you look at this, uh, this only depends on distances between atoms, uh, but uh, it's not, for instance, invariant uh, relative to rotations uh, of my reference frame. So to incorporate rotations, what we can do is integrate over the SO3 group. And if you do this, uh, for instance, uh, and you integrate just this atom-centered density over rotations, uh, you obtain something which is equivalent to a pair correlation function. So you now have information on how many atoms you have at a certain distance from your central atom. Of course, we are throwing away a lot of information here. We have no more information on angular correlations that are very important to determine the energetics of many materials. But we can bring these back in once again by integrating over SO3 a tensor pro product of two of these atom-centered densities. And actually, in practice, you can build a whole hierarchy of endpoint density correlations, symmetrize them over the rotation group, and obtain a hierarchy of uh, body order descriptions of an atomic environment. And what I find very, very pleasing is on one hand, the fact that statistical physics has been using uh, uh, endpoint correlation functions to describe disordered systems for one and a half centuries. And the second very pleasing aspect is that if you use these endpoint correlations as uh, into a linear model, so you just do linear regression using these endpoint correlations, what you obtain is are objects that are equivalent to n body uh, potentials. So essentially, this for all those of you who have some experience in atomic scale modeling, uh, very the many body expansion of, for instance, the interatomic potential, where you say, okay, I write my potential energy as a sum over pair plus a sum over triples, uh, sum over quadruples, and so on and so forth, uh, has been around uh, forever. And uh, I find it very nice that the outcome of this construction is a featureization of a material such that a linear model corresponds to this time-tested way of constructing models of atomistic properties. Now, I meant, as I anticipated before, another aspect that I like a lot from this construction is that these uh, abstract objects that describe endpoint correlations uh, can be converted into a lot of different uh, descriptors that are currently in use uh, just by a choice of a different basis function. So for instance, uh, starting from the uh, representation that is only uh, translationally symmetrized, um, you could choose a plane wave basis rather than a position basis. And this actually has been used as a representation of structures. Uh, and when you move on to atom-centered descriptors, uh, you realize that beller parinello symmetry function and the DeepMD framework uh, most of the deep neural network models of potentials that are in use today have actually been, uh, can be written in such a way that they are just the projection over a certain set of basis functions of uh, these body order uh, representations. Now, if uh, you want to describe objects that should be uh, integrated over SO3, in my opinion, the most natural way of describing the density is by means of uh, spherical harmonics, of a spherical harmonics expansion. And actually, uh, if you do that, um, and then you write the high body order terms in this basis, you rediscover a uh, soap power spectrum that Gabor uh, Chani and collaborator have been using very successfully over uh, the past decade. Um, and actually, you can see that uh, these, uh, that basically integrating over the rotation group uh, the features uh, is fully equivalent to the traditional construction of SOAP uh, as an integral uh, of uh, an overlap between densities. So you, you can really see that 
uh, if you have uh, features that are symmetrized over the rotation group, very naturally also their uh, scalar product will be symmetrized over rotations in the same way. And just to give another example of a way in which this construction uh, uh, converges to other uh, featureizations, if you take uh, the delta distribution limit of the Gaussian functions, you discover uh, the atomic cluster expansion that has been introduced by Ralph Drauz last year. Um, a very important uh, and somehow open question that we are uh, trying to address currently with, with Gabor uh, and uh, other friends uh, um, is whether this hierarchy of body order descriptors provides a full characterization of an environment. It's very clear that if you stop at distances, this is not a uh, injective description of an environment. You can have different, uh, very, very different structures that have the same pair correlation function. Uh, many of us, uh, myself and Gabor included, believed that, that actually the three body term would have been enough, uh, but we have found actually thanks to a fantastically bright uh, undergraduate student, uh, um, that this is not true, so this is not an injective uh, representation. And so probably one has to go up in the body order hierarchy just to make sure that the description of an atomic environment uh, is uh, injective and therefore you can use it to really uh, exactly uh, tag a structure in a machine learning model. Um, another aspect that we have been working on very actively is what happens if you want to learn a property that is not a scalar, but is, for instance, a dipole moment or a polarizability. So a property that transforms intrinsically in a tensorial way. And it turns out that using a very similar construction as the one that I discussed to construct invariant representations, you can also build equivariant representation uh, that transforms uh, like spherical harmonics, and then you can use as the basis uh, to build machine learning models of properties that transform like tensors. So this far I have talked about the symmetry properties of representations for learning uh, molecular and materials properties. Uh, but another very interesting aspect of this construction is that it naturally gives rise to a representation that is atom-centered, just as a consequence of requiring translational invariance. Now, atom centering of this representation is extremely important to achieve a transferable model because in a linear or kernel regre regression model, but also if you use a deep learning model that uses as input these atom centered descriptions, you end up naturally with a description of a global property of your system, let's say the total energy, as a sum of atom-centered contributions. And this is very, very useful because it allows you to build up uh, structures uh, as Lego bricks. So these atom-centered environments become your building blocks and you can train your model on relatively simple systems and then assemble them back in a different form and build a system that is more complex and potentially more interesting. Of course, the core question at this point becomes uh, how local is local? Electronic structure theory has some fundamental principles that suggest that indeed uh, the structure property relationships should always be local because the density matrix decays exponentially uh, in any finite temperature system. But you know, how local is local? Is it uh, two Ohmstrom, 20 Ohmstrom, 1000 Ohmstrom? So you can try to answer this question in a, some kind of empirical manner by building models, in this case of the cohesive energy of some organic molecules, using representations that are truncated at different length scale. So I like a lot this exercise because it basically allows you to put to a test um, a hypothesis on what is the range of interactions. The model is completely flexible, completely general, but I artificially truncate the information, for instance, at two Ohmstrom. 
And then uh, these are learning curves, so showing how accurate is my model after it has been trained on 500,000 or 2,000 molecules. And what you can see here is that if you have uh, uh, only a small training set, a short range model is by far uh, the most effective. And I think that the reason why this is the case is that here we are looking at, uh, sorry, uh, at uh, uh, organic molecules. And so most of the cohesive energy is down to covalent bonding, which is very well described within a couple of Ohmstone. But what you see now is that if you increase the training set size, the accuracy of the model saturates. And this is because we don't have enough information to even describe, let's say, hydrogen bonding, let alone uh, long range interactions. And then you can increase the cutoff to 2.5 and you see that, you know, initially this performs worse, but then uh, this takes the lead and eventually also this model is going to saturate. So one thing that you can learn from this exercise is that uh, interactions in molecules are multiscale perhaps not so surprising. And what you can do then is use this insight to build better models. For instance, build a model that is constructed as a sum of uh, models with different length scales. And by weighting these models uh, in a way that reflects the importance of interactions at different length scales, you can build a multi-scale model that performs better than any of the models with a single cutoff. And this is really sort of preconditioning our representation to reflect the structure property relationships for a specific system. Now, the next five minutes, I'm gonna go super fast over a bunch of applications of this framework. And the message here is that, first of all, this is already mature enough that you can use it to solve actual physical problems. Again, uh, Gabor's talk uh, previously in this meeting has already shown you how you can address very pressing and complicated scientific questions using machine learning. Um, but also to show you how generally applicable this is. You know, I'm not building a model specifically looking at the connectivity of a molecule, I'm just describing my system in terms of endpoint correlation functions. And so you can use it, for instance, to address questions like, uh, why is ice hexagonal? This is actually not such an obvious question. There is a cubic form of ice that is very close in free energy with the hexagonal form. And the problem is that the difference in free energy be between these two polymorphs can't be just described by the lattice energy of the most stable configurations. You need to incorporate finite temperature thermodynamics, and you need to incorporate the quantum mechanical nature of uh, the hydrogen atoms. And so the idea here is that we build a framework in which we sample all of the complicated quantum thermodynamics of the system using a machine learning potential. And then uh, the machine learning potential is not actually accurate enough to get the level of precision that we need to address this specific question. And so very pragmatically, what we do is we do free energy perturbation, which is a simple technique to promote the machine learning potential to full ab initio, first principle quantum mechanical accuracy. And to do this, we just need a couple of thousand of single point energy calculations, which is entirely feasible. And by doing this, we can actually predict without any free parameter, uh, the melting point of water within a handful of Kelvin. We can predict the difference in melting point between light and heavy water. And we can predict that indeed uh, ice is hexagonal. And according to our calculations, it is hexagonal thanks uh, or due to uh, the quantum mechanical fluctuations of the hydrogen nuclei. So if you treat the system with classical protons, uh, you find that ice should be cubic and who knows what would be of the Swiss skiing industry if ice was cubic. So then uh, you can also apply this to a different class of systems, uh, molecular materials. Uh, molecular materials exhibit a high degree of polymorphism and you can predict the relative stability of different polymorphs 
training on a small number of structures and then all the other possible polymers you can predict using machine learning. And the reason why I like to show this slide is that we have three molecules that look very similar, but the performance of the model is very different. And this is really showing how this is no magic. Uh, and this molecule, this 5B form, has an asymmetric substitution, which makes it more likely to form complex uh, disordered conf configurations. And so just the dimensionality of the crystal structure and scape is much higher, and you need many more reference calculations to be able to predict uh, the stability of the polymers at the same accuracy as those that you can obtain for a pentacene with just a few tens. Uh, you can use this also for other properties than the energy. Here you can see the accuracy in predicting the NMR chemical shieldings. And you can try this for yourself on shiftml.org. You can upload the structure of a molecular compound and will tell you the NMR chemical shielding of each nucleus in, uh, the, uh, in the crystal. Uh, you can use this tensorial framework to predict the tensorial properties. And here, for instance, you can see that for small molecules, we can achieve an accuracy by using a training on couple cluster reference calculations. And this is in collaboration with Rob Distasio, who actually did with his team all of the couple cluster calculations. We basically can get an accuracy which beats density function theory by a factor of two while being orders of magnitude faster. You can use these also to predict other tensorial properties like dipoles. And dipoles are interesting because the polarization in a molecule or in a molecular system is often a combination of uh, local polarization and long range charge transfer. And here we build a model that incorporates both physical effects and we can use it to predict the um, dipoles in very large molecules by training on molecules with just a handful of atoms. You can also use these to predict something complicated like the Raman spectrum of a molecular compound. And even though I don't have time to talk about this, uh, some aspect that I like a lot about this application is that we apply a method that allows us to have end-to-end -end uncertainty quantification. So we can put error bars on the Raman spectra of these materials. And you can see clearly that on this compound, the model has been trained. So the error bars are very small. And then we use the same model on a different polymorph and the error bars become larger. And this is kind of trivial, but it's good to know if you in the end want to trust your predictions. Uh, we are already combining these with quantum dynamics to get uh, uh, prediction, for instance, of uh, uh, IR and Raman spectra that also incorporate the quantum mechanical nature of the protons. This is a whole new story, but I, I just want to make the point that this is already at, at the level where we can just incorporate it in very complex uh, atomistic modeling uh, protocols. And uh, uh, this uh, tensorial scheme can also be used to predict properties like the charge density. So we can uh, uh, train the model on small molecules, on the electron charge density of small molecules. And this is based on at atom-centered expansion. And so we are predicting coefficients that transform like spherical harmonics. And so this tensorial machine learning scheme is absolutely essential for this. And the point is that again, thanks to this uh, Lego brick construction of the model, we can train on small compounds and then make predictions for full proteins. And we can use this, for instance, to predict the electrostatic potential on the surface of a protein, which can be used to model the binding of drug molecules to a protein, which acquire this electrostatic term, which can now be achieved with ab initio accuracy without the need of linear scaling DFT or whatever. Now, I want to just very, very quickly go through what I believe to be one of the big open problems in all of these, uh, which is long range physics. Everything that I told you this far is deeply rooted into locality. I'm breaking down my model into environments of a few Ohmstrom in radius and expecting to be able to predict all the properties of my system based 
on the short range information. And uh, if you want to do this to a system which is driven by electrostatics, uh, you are up for some big disappointment. And if, if you have, I don't know if you have ever seen, uh, this is undergraduate level uh, solid state uh, uh, physics. Um, if you try to compute the cohesive energy of a ionic system, sodium chloride, let's say, uh, because of the one over R dependence of the electrostatic interaction, you get a different answer depending on whether you sum over sphere or over cubes. And this is a consequence of the fact that you have a series that is not absolutely convergent. And you can imagine uh, this is going to be a nightmare once we try to build a, a, a short range model for this. This will give us a different answer depending uh, on the shape of the local environment. And indeed, if you try to build uh, based on a local description, a machine learning model for something like the cohesive, the, the binding curves of charged compounds, you basically can't predict these at all. So the idea that we are having to deal with this problem is still to preserve some concept of locality, because this is the only way you can build in transferability, in my opinion. And the idea is that we start from this atom density that I've used to construct these local descriptors. And the idea is that while still treating the system at the global level, we solve the Poisson equation and find the potential that is associated with that, this atom density. This is an entirely fictitious uh, potential. And indeed, we have a different potential for each atomic species. So this is not the electrostatic potential, but it has the right asymptotic behavior, which means that once we do the usual gig of symmetrizing this global field, we obtain a local descriptor that has the right long range asymptotic behavior. Even if it's a global problem, it can be solved efficiently in reciprocal space. You know, 30 minutes. Uh... Yeah. Solving the Poisson equation is something that has been done for quite a long time. Um, and so just want to show you the results. You know, if you go back to this problem of uh, finding the binding curves between charged uh, compounds, as soon as you switch on this long range term, even though we are only training the model on configurations that are up to eight Ohmstrom separation, we get a very qualitative, uh, a very good qualitative and often also quantitative uh, behavior of the long range interaction up, you know, up unto hundreds of Ohmstrom. And you can see this, that for these many different compounds, you know, these molecules are not in the train set. And even for the molecules in the train set, uh, we never incorporate structures beyond eight Ohmstrom. So this is a very difficult extrapolative uh, exercise and the model behaves splendidly. So to wrap up, I want to uh, say that I'm very, very excited about the use of machine learning for atomic scale uh, modeling because it's really allowing me in the end uh, to do stuff that I've always wanted to do with incorporating quantum and thermodynamic uh, fluctuations into materials modeling. And I'm finding uh, that incorporating physical ideas into machine learning uh, is something that really helps you a great deal into getting models that are easier to train and more transferable. And an aspect that I'm also very keen on is, you know, trying to play games with the machine learning model, switching on and off terms, and trying to learn something about the physics of the system through these data-driven exercises. So with this, I just want to thank the members of my group, collaborators, funding bodies, and leave you with a few references. And if you have some questions, I will be very, very glad to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michele, for your very interesting talk. And uh, are there questions? No questions so far? Um, Sorry. Yes? No? OK. No, no, I had switched the wrong uh, window. 
I'll have a question. So um, in the beginning of your talk, um, when you uh, just introduce those densities for um, uh, dealing with the permutation invariance, mm -hmm. you mentioned at some point that there is an information loss going on. Can you yeah. say something about uh, a, a sort of, uh, you know, is there kind of an optimality how uh, you would uh, uh, pretend, um, how you would sort of try to minimize that information loss? And so it's actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can give you, this is a very interesting question and very closely related to this issue of uh, injectivity of the representations. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very easy to see. Imagine that you take this representation, okay? And I integrate uh, over the translation group. So what's going to happen? I'm going to integrate uh, over R plus T, where T is a vector. So if the Gaussian is normalized, uh, I'm losing all of the geometric information. The only thing that is left uh, is the chemical composition of my system. I'm just going to have information on which atoms are in my system uh, and not about where they are. Yeah. Now, if you already, if you take uh, the uh, tensor product of two densities, you already end up with something that, in my opinion, has enough information to describe the structure fully, because you have information on all of the pair distances vector, the pair distance vectors in your system. So since you can't have two entirely overlapping atoms, this would be already sufficient information to fully reconstruct your structure. Okay. So this is enough. Now, when you go to rotations, again, you have the same problem. If you just take one density, you only have information on the histogram of distances, which is not enough to reconstruct an environment. If you take two density, you have the histogram of three point correlations, which we thought was enough until Sergei showed us a counterexample. And this actually is an open question. How high is high enough? Empirically, the four point correlation seems to be enough, but we also have some counterexamples that are, however, a little bit uh, uh, too arcane to actually matter in real life. But it's an it's a open question. And it's a very important question because, yes, you are incorporating symmetries, but you don't want to throw away the possibility of fully determining your structure. Okay. Um, any other questions? Maybe I have a quick question. So yeah. um, I understand that um, no, uh, say out of equilibrium phenomena are notoriously hard. So if I produce an exciton and then uh, want to study this, uh, do these machine learning techniques promise also to help in that uh, hard direction? So, okay, so th this is actually, yeah, no, no, this is a, this is a very interesting uh, uh, problem. And it's interesting in, in two ways. One is that uh, uh, something like an exciton is, uh, is basically an excited state. So the underlying assumption behind all of the, what I told you about today is the fact that uh, um, everything is a slave to the configuration of the nuclei. So if, I, if you tell me the configuration of the nuclei, I should be able to tell you what is the energy of the system. Now, if you have an excited state, you also need to specify on which excitation level you are. So there is some work going on on describing excited states. You know, if the system is stays adiabatically on a well-defined excited state, this is just uh, an additional piece of information that you provide in the training phase. Having something that describes adiabat non-adiabatic processes is a very, very interesting uh, problem because conceptually, at that point, uh, you can't describe the structure, the, the state of your system using only the position of the atoms. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, in my opinion, and this is a little bit the direction in which I'm moving on, uh, not specifically to address the non-adiabatic dynamic problem, but because I think it's a good research direction in general, I, I, I think that the trick might be uh, not to predict directly the end property of your system, but to 
predict something uh, which is uh, one st step behind in the physics-based uh, uh, modeling. For instance, the Hamiltonian uh, or the density of excitations. Uh, and, and then uh, you inject some explicit physics-based modeling uh, uh, where it's needed. Because there are many physical processes. And I think that this is a very important general consideration when you try to apply machine learning to science uh, is that there are many processes. Uh, in the previous talk, we heard about laminar flow. I mean, if you have a process for which physically linear interpolation is great, uh, then uh, what's the point of going to fancy machine learning techniques? Uh, physics uh, is helping you more than enough. So you want machine learning to help you with the parts that for which the physical equations are very hard to solve. But if there are bits and pieces for which physics is easy, then you should use physics. And this is also a little bit uh, the idea behind uh, these long range uh, descriptors. Poisson equation is physics uh, and it's simple enough. Uh, so I don't want to learn uh, electrostatics. I want to use physics to describe electrostatics, uh, but with the flexibility that is afforded by a more general uh, regression scheme than saying just, okay, I have a point charge model. Thank you.